Welcome to video number two of the grid and renewables. Right now we're going to talk about the supply and demand of the grid. Let's start with demand. Okay, so um, maybe the craziest thing that, about the grid that people, including myself, often don't always realize is that there is no energy storage in the grid. Which means when you take a unit of energy out of the grid, so if this is your house, and here are the power lines, and those are connected to a transformer station, which looks something like this, which steps it up so that it can go to the power plant. Right, so when I, as I'm recording this video and my laptop is consuming energy, it's converting some of this electric power. So electric power is going into my laptop and then coming out as an equivalent amount of thermal energy. It's converting electricity essentially into thermal energy because of the second law of thermodynamics and because energy cannot be created or destroyed. Uh, but because we're taking this power out, we must add power in electric power back into that power plant, which comes in, in this case, in the form of coal that we add into the power plant to burn more, or it could be sunlight shining on a PV or wind turning a wind turbine. Regardless, the moment this came out, that had to go in. There is no energy storage, no delay, which means that power must be generated in real time. Uh, which doesn't seem like a big deal. You know, okay, well, we'll just make it. We'll watch. Oh, they're using more. Let's throw in some more coal. Um, and it, it used to be that easy. Back when the grid was new, they just turned up or down the uh, steam. <laughs> really, literally. But then we started needed the grid to be reliable and very reliable. Um, there are some very, very tight tolerances on the grid. For example, the frequency of the alternating current in the lines must be equal to 60 Hertz plus or minus 0.05 Hertz. It must never deviate beyond those limits, which um, is pretty crazy because any demand or supply mismatch causes the frequency to change. Changes the frequency. So let's say I am using my laptop up here on my drawing and I'm pulling power out of the grid and turning it into thermal energy. But let's say they're having a problem at the power plant and it's shut down. They can't add that back in. Well then the frequency in the lines is going to go down. And it will go down pretty bad, um, drop quite precipitously if they aren't able to add in, once again, that energy to bring it back up. Um, so this doesn't just magically control itself. This is a very complicated system filled with moving parts, which the grid controller manages. This is a person who manages the voltage and the frequency of an independent section of the grid related back to those regional control centers we looked at earlier. Uh, so this person plays a very important role um, and we want them to be good at their job. Okay, so let's look at the actual demand. Um, this right here gives a typical load. Again, so when we say load, we mean the power being pulled out of the grid by um, things plugged into electric sockets, turning on lights, turning on motors. This is the load or consuming electricity out of the grid for the New England area in 2010. Um, so you see there is what we will call a base load, which I will draw with red about there. Here is our base load which is a constant minimum value of power required. So at any time in the day, 
um, it's fairly certain the base load is going to happen unless there's something crazy like New Year's Eve, I'm sure uh, the peak is greater. Or if everyone decides to go outside, then maybe the base load has gone down. I bet you now I'm recording this during the COVID-19 crisis. I do not doubt that our base load has probably gone down a little bit. Okay, uh, then let's look at some other loads. There is the peak load as shown right here. So the peak load is the greatest load that the grid will see in 24 hours. And we're gonna talk about exactly how we meet that demand. And then with another color, we'll also talk about here we're going to call this the mid-merit load. I'm not sure if that's the official official term, um, but what this is is kind of the, the daylight load, you know, that we've increased above the base load. Right, during nighttime, you know, as people fall asleep between here and then begin to wake up, we see a decrease in power consumption. Okay, let's talk about a few parts we see here. Right, so we've got, uh, we just talked about how everyone goes to sleep and the grid silently, I mean slowly, just kind of falls down. But then um, in the morning hours, we start to see this ramp up. So the morning ramp is when everyone wakes up and they turn on their coffee makers and of course everything else but yes yeah, just as an illustration so everyone wakes up they're turning on everything in their home turning on the lights the dishwasher uh the oven you name it and then life stays fairly constant as there's this interplay between going to work going out to lunch staying at home lights turn off as the sun gets brighter but other things turn on um then uh, around five o'clock, everyone comes home. Oops. And so at the peak is when everyone comes home and turns on their coffee makers again. And But there's still people at work possibly leaving the lights on. And so we see that um, industry is still using power and then residential starts to pick up before industry turns off and we drop down as people go to sleep. So that's kind of the reason for the shape of the demand curve as it is. Now, like we said, right, there's no energy storage in the grid. We need to meet that in real time. So how are we going to do that? Let's talk about the supply, the energy supply going into the grid. So like we talked about in the first video, we have kind of different ranges of plants. We'll call the first one base generation. These are very large power plants, nuclear power plants, coal power plants, I mean large coal power plants, um, maybe large hydro generators, um, things that essentially never turn off. Since we always have that base load, we might as well provide that base load with a power plant that is really hard to turn on, but once it turns on, it operates efficiently. And especially important for the utility company, it operates on the cheap. This is the cheapest energy we can get because it's the most efficient. We should note that it takes hours, usually, um, for these things to turn on. You don't just turn on a coal power plant. There's not a switch. Uh, you gotta make steam. That takes a while. Imagine watching water boil. <laughs> That's what it's like uh, turning on a coal power plant. Okay, but we need to figure out how to meet this peak demand, right? So we've got this base load chugging along, you know, burning natural gas, letting water flow, or, you know, making uranium go through the fission process. But we need to somehow respond to these very quick changes and so we have peak generation facilities, which are small power plants, things like 
very large diesel engines think like the giant engine on an aircraft carrier strapped to the ground um, or small gas turbines things that aren't combined cycle but just a single gas turbine less efficient easier to turn on hydro even though it's kind of a large plant you can turn it on and off fairly easily and quickly then also energy storage which you can bring online really fast okay so there's kind of two um, different types of peak generation there's what we've already called the mid merit power plants uh, these are turned on in order to meet daylight demand so around five in the morning you might start powering up your smallish gas turbine which operates somewhat efficiently but not as efficiently as these larger power plants uh, and then we have peaking plants which are the smallest and most importantly the least efficient but they are fast to turn on you could turn this thing on in a matter of seconds to minutes when you see that the grid is starting to get stressed and the um, frequency is dropping okay but an important thing here is of course least efficient we don't want to run these peaking plants but we have to because the grid must be reliable um, these mid merit plants they will be somewhat efficient especially these gas turbines but they won't be as competitive as these large power plants they will cost more to operate these are the cheapest these are more expensive and these will be the most expensive and as a utility company if you want to make money you want to get rid of these and run these as much as possible that's how it used to work then renewable energy came around in this next video we're going to talk about what renewables have been doing to the grid and how we might adjust ourselves to account for these new challenges